Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Rashid Hassan, the founder and CEO of Dentoscope. And uh, today I am joined by one of the very renowned academician, a very experienced teacher, a graduate of De Montmorency College of Dentistry and a trainer. Uh, he's uh, serving in Canada for the past uh, almost eight to 10 years, I guess. So we have Dr. Nagman Zuberi with us and uh, he is going to deliver the first lecture of uh, his series of lectures on oral biology. The topic for today is uh, dental enamel. So I hand over uh, the uh, session to uh, Dr. Nakman Zuberi Saab. Sir, uh, let's proceed with the, today's session. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Asalaamu Alaikum. Good morning from my side. I don't know wherever you are in the world. So whatever the time is, so appropriately, you can consider my greetings according to that time. So I'm going to share my screen with you. So we will be discussing today enamel of teeth. Or enamel as such in dentistry. Enamel is the hardest biological tissue. It is present as the outermost covering of the crown of a tooth. Enamel is the epithelial derived heart tissue. And the cells which form it, they are called ameloblasts. Ameloblasts, after completing the enamel formation, they regress. They are no more present over there. They persist as the uh, enamel sheath, or you can say the outer covering or the cuticle. When the enamel uh, is completed, then they are no more viable. They do not have the capability to produce more enamel. And as the tooth erupts, that outer covering, it wears off. So it is no more existent after a couple of months or a couple of years. So ameloblasts, they are not present. So if the enamel is lost by any means, either chemical or mechanical, whatever, or maybe by trauma, it cannot be re uh, generated. It is a non-vital tissue. It is acellular and it is avascular. The outermost covering of the crown, as I told you, is enamel. It is translucent tissue and the color is from yellowish white to grayish white. Thickness a different parts of the tooth and from tooth to tooth it varies. Hardness is almost 296 new hardness number. It's very brittle. And as the age advances, it becomes even more brittle. The specific gravity of enamel is 2.8 and its density is 2.82 three grams per square centimeter. Enamel in the beginning is semi-permeable and as the age advances, it the uh, permeability, it reduces. When we look at the chemical structure, in organic material or the appetite crystals, these are 96%. And organic substances and water, they are 4%. That is, we are talking about by weight. In volume, the organic matter and water, they are nearly equal to the inorganic contents. We will be discussing about the structure of enamel, like rods, rod shed, interprismatic substance, striations, then directions of the rods, the hunter Schrieger bands, incremental lines of radius, surface structures, enamel cuticle, enamel lamellae, 
enamel tufts, dentino enamel junction, even cemento enamel junction, etc., etc. Enamel rods, these are the basic structure of enamel. Five million in lower lateral incisors. We are talking about the smallest tooth, lower lateral incisors. Five million at an average enamel rods are present. So just imagine the number of enamel rods in a canine or in first molar. 12 million in upper maxillary molar, like at the upper first molar, I, I must say. Length of rod is greater than thickness of enamel as they follow an oblique and baby course. Average diameter of an enamel rod is 4 micron. When we look at the cross section, it resembles as a fish scale. That's why the famous fish scale appearance of enamel rods is being used in the books of dental anatomy. But once we look at the rods, they are having actually a keyhole pattern. Enamel rod is the basic structural unit of the enamel. And they are actually shaped like cylinders. The whole length just resembles like a cylinder. When we look at the outer surface, or you can say at one of the, when we do the cross section and when we look under the microscope, it appears like a keyhole type of thing, like this. <laughs> Crystals in the cylinder, cylindrical rod, they run parallel to the longitudinal axis of the rod, particularly for crystals along the central axis of the rod. Crystals in the central axis, they run parallel. Crystals more distant from the central axis, they flare out. Interrod region is an area surrounding each rod in which crystals are oriented in different directions from those making up the rod. The boundary where crystals of the rod meet, those of the interrod region at sharp angles, that is known as the rod shed. Portion of interrod region located directly cervical to particular are not separated as crystals are confluent with those making the rod. As I have already mentioned, the cross-sectional outline has been described as the keyhole analogy. Cylindrical rod that has a specific spatial relation to the interrod region is directly cervical to it. It is directly cervical to it. Relation to amelogenesis. Actually, amelogenesis is the process by which enamel is formed. Walls, a, they are formed by secretion from the proximal sites and the distal portion of tomes process lays down the central rod portion. Each wall is formed by cooperative effort by the secretory ameloblasts. And each ameloblast is responsible for one rod and portion of surrounding interrod substances. Rod shed contains more enamel proteins than other regions as crystals meeting at different angles cannot be packed together tightly. Stry of ridges, the growth pattern or the uh, how the enamel is growing, that is expressed by the deposition of enamel, which are like in one day or in 24 hours, how much enamel is being deposited. So that is represented by the incremental growth lines. These are the series of dark bands reflecting successive enamel forming fronts. These striophrasias, they are prominent mostly in the permanent teeth as compared to deciduous teeth. 
they are, uh, as I told you, they are less prominent in the postnatal deciduous enamel because deciduous enamel is very, very thin and it starts wearing off as the child starts using the teeth, they start masticatory process. So it becomes very like it wear off and the uh, structure is not very clear in the postnatal deciduous teeth. Striophrasias, they are formed as a result of temporary constriction of tomes process associated with a corresponding increase in the secretory phase forming interrod enamel. Interrod enamel. This is the interrod enamel. These are the tomes process. This is the uh, schematic diagram of an ameloblast. When the ameloblast is secreting enamel, it's organelles they are at the uh, one side it becomes like the uh, elongated and all the uh, organelles they accumulate on one side and then there are processes elongated processes which are known as the domes processes striophrasias these are the, those which we have discussed and when these lines they are accentuated those are produced by systemic disturbances like fever that affects the amelogenesis enamel rod bends across an incremental line neonatal lines are enlarged striophrasias and those represent like when the child is born and the environment changes. Those are not present in the prenatal enamel. Human enamel form at a rate of approximately four micron per day. Periodic bands or cross striations are present at five micron intervals across the rod. This optical phenomena of alternate dark and light bands, that is known as bands of Hunter and Schrieger or Hunter and Schrieger bands. This is basically a phenomena like if you change the light, then it will be illuminated alternately as dark and light. If you change the direction, then the lighter light uh, rods they will become darker and the darker they will become light these are viewed most clearly in longitudinal section they are present in the inner four fifth of the enamel they appear as alternate dark and light bands i have already mentioned that and when you change the direction of the light then the darker they will become lighter and the lighter they will become darker alternating Nailed enamel. Nailed enamel is a description of enamel seen in histologic sections of a tooth underneath a cusp. This is an optical appearance of enamel. The appearance of enamel appears different and very complex in these areas. The strange appearance results from the lines of enamel rods directed vertically under a cusp and form and from their orientation in a small circumstance. Nailed enamel can sometimes be a problem for the dentist when they are preparing a tooth. Nailed enamel can cause the pores to wear off quickly when they are preparing the tooth and in some cases the dentist must replace the pores very frequently for having the cutting efficiency. The toughness of nailed enamel varies from a person to person, and usually it is not a very serious problem. When we talk about the word nailed, it means knobbly, rough, twisted, and that actually comes with age. This word, uh, this word uh, nailed, it was actually being used for the oak trees as they aged, so the word uh, not a uh, nailed uh, word it was there and we adapted that word from the uh, word which was being used the nailed word for nailed word actually for the 
oak wood. Rods appear twisted around each other in a complex arrangement. And how? Actually, just like a washer. If you look at it, so more close to each other, and as they we go down, then they start separating under the cusp. Each row surrounds the long axis of the tooth like a washer, as I have already mentioned. The rods undulate back and forth within the rows. The undulation in vertically directed rows around a ring of a small circumference results in the gnarled enamel. Then we have enamel tufts as well. They project for a shorter distance from the dentino enamel junction into the enamel. They appear to be branched and contain greater concentration of enamel protein. So over here, actually, they are hypomineralized, more proteins and less minerals in enamel tufts. Protein in tufts is of high molecular weight variety similar to the enamelin. Enamelin is a type of enamel uh, protein. They occur developmentally due to abrupt changes in the directions. They extend for varying depth from the surface of enamel. Linear, longitudinally oriented defects filled with enamel protein as well as other organic debris which is coming from the oral cavity. As a person uses their teeth, they eat the food, saliva, the mucinous products, etc., etc. Enamel lamellae, these are leaf-like structures extending from the enamel towards the dentino enamel junction. And they develop in planes of tension. These are of three types. Type A, composed of poorly calcified rod segments. Type B, consists of degenerated cells. Type C, filled with organic material, presumably arising from the slime. Enamel spindles. <laughs> Before enamel forms, some newly formed odontoblasts, they are being pushed between the ameloblasts. Upon calcification of enamel, these areas are also hypocalcified. Now, over here, we need to know very important point. First of all, keep in mind <clears throat> that once the ameloblasts, they are differentiated, once the ameloblasts, they are differentiated, then they differentiate the odontoblasts. Then they differentiate the odontoblasts. Once the odontoblasts are differentiated, they firstly lay down the first layer of dentine. They firstly lay down the first layer of dentine. When first layer of dentine is laid down, after that, the first layer of enamel is being laid down. And keep in mind, this dentino enamel junction is never a straight line. It is always a corrugated type of or a scooped out type of appearance. Let me change the pointer. Yes. Dentino enamel junction, as I told you, is a scalloped or corrugated type of structure. It has shallow depressions of dentine, fit rounded projections of enamel. Cemento enamel junction. A cemento enamel junction, frequently abbreviated as CEJ, is a slightly visible anatomical border identified on a tooth. It is the location where the enamel, which covers the anatomical crown of the tooth, and the cementum, which covers the anatomical root, they meet. That is known as cemento enamel junction. Well, there are three variations of cemento enamel junction. Most frequently, cementum, it overlaps the enamel. At times, a butt joint, 
90 degree end to end relationship is there. Well, some of the time they do not meet, they leave a gap and dentine is exposed in that area. Enamel surface. Striophrasias extend from the entire enamel junction to outer surface of enamel where they end in shallow furrows that is known as perichymata. They run in circumferential horizontal lines across the surface of the crown. This area. Enamel surface we are discussing, their cracks, the enamel lamellae, they may appear in several parts of the crown. Then electronic microscopic features, they vary with age. When we are talking about the unerupted tooth, structural layer, surface layer of 0.5 to 1.5 micron thick, it will be present on the surface. A layer of a small, loosely packed crystallites of 5 nanometer thickness as well. Erupted tooth, the structural layer, layer it is lost within a couple of months after eruption due to abrasion use masticatory process tooth brushing etc etc as the age advances the enamel it has certain changes progressively because of wear and tear the normal incisal and occlusal surfaces they get worn off that is the physiological attrition. But certain people, because of the uh, clenching habit, bruxism, they have very advanced occlusal surface wearing a phenomena. That is pathological attrition. Wear facets are increasingly seen over cuspal tips and incisal edges. It starts becoming discolored as well, depending upon so many features. One is aging itself and then the habits like tobacco, coffee stains, and even the environment and uh, food they eat, all that, it also affects. The permeability I have told you in the beginning, it is reduced and surface layer is also changes. Well, we try our level best that the biggest enemy of enamel, that is the irreversible destruction, which we call caries, that is not going to occur. Or if it has started in the smooth surface areas, in the proximal areas, it may get reversed by the process known as fluoridation. So we provide fluoride, either we apply it topically or we stress them to have community supply water, which is rich in fluoride, as well as we tell them to take care of their oral cavity. They should more stress on their oral hygiene maintenance. So what happens in fluoridation? Crystals, they become more resistant to acid dissolution. The reason is the normal hydroxyapatite crystal, it becomes fluorapatite crystal, which is more acid resistant. The amount of fluoride sh should be well controlled ex as excess of fluoride causes fluorescence. Fluoride in surface reduces free energy over surface, thus decreasing the adsorption of glycoproteins from the saliva. Fluoride enhances chemical reaction that leads to precipitation of calcium phosphate. So what happens when the person is having saliva rich in fluoride? Whenever there is some challenge in the form of plaque and the pH is reduced, that fluoride is going to be adsorbed, it is going to be uh, coming closer to the surface of the tooth and up to two micron of the surface of the tooth, it is going to have hydroxyapatite crystals instead of own, like the hydroxyapatite crystals, they will be transformed into fluorapatite crystals. Topical fluoride is the 
best method for deposition. That is why pedodontists, they call the children regularly and they apply the topical fluoride on regular basis. Other than that, the uh, community water supply is rich in fluoridation in most parts of the world now because knowing the uh, importance of fluoride in water, so most of the governments, they have worked very hard and the uh, community water supply, it is rich in fluoride. So that water will be again present in the saliva. So in case whenever there will be a challenge from the sugary diet or anything. So there will be chances of acid production in the presence of plaque. Whenever there will be some demineralization process going on, the fluoride uh, crystals, they will be depositing over here. The ions will be depositing here. And the uh, our hydroxyapatite crystal would be transformed into the fluorapatite crystal. Another important thing which we need to know about uh, floor, uh, this uh, enamel is acid etching because now most of the people they prefer in case of the, uh, if they have some cavity or other defects that they want tooth color filling material. For tooth color filling material, we need to etch the enamel as well as dentine. So anywhere between actually 15 to 45 percent of phosphoric acid can be used. Most commonly 30 to 40 percent orthophosphoric acid is used up to 60 seconds to etch the depth of 10 micron. That etching could be of any type like type 1 which is preferential removal of the rod coat. It is the most common type of etching which you will see. Type 2, preferentially rod periphery removed, leaving the core intact. Type 3 will be irregular and indiscriminate. It is probably due to the type of agent or nature of the enamel. Type 4, pitted enamel surfaces as well as structures that look like unfinished puzzle, maps, or networks. And type 5, the etching has not been done flat smooth surface type one and type two are the two most uh, like common as well as acceptable forms of etching the chemical treatment by acid etching enhances the topography of enamel changing it from a low reactive surface to a surface that is more susceptible to adhesion the demineralization is selective because of the morphological disposition of the prisms. The difference of angulation of the prism crystals causes the acid to have higher demineralization potential at certain micro regions. In type 1 etching, the demineralization is at prism head and in type 2 etching is at the periphery. So we can see here the prism head is missing and over here periphery is missing. Yes, one important thing, no matter it is type 1 or type 2, both are acceptable and difference in these types of etching is not clinically relevant. A clinically successful acid etch procedure is dependent on a number of factors like a desirable edge pattern and adequate resin penetration, prevention of contamination of edged enamel surfaces before placement of resin, adequate rinse time to effectively remove calcium phosphate precipitates, achieving a porous layer of approximately 10 micron deep between 5 micron and 60 micron. So over here, a brief introduction about the enamel and uh, some clinical implications I have provided to you. So as we will be moving with these uh, series of lecture, we can always discuss about the amylogenesis. We can go for dentinogenesis. We will talk about the cementum and how it's being produced. Then even we can have a uh, topic on uh, tooth development and tooth eruption, etc., etc. 
and certain other topics which Dr. Rashid has already given to me that I can uh, give lectures on it. So every Wednesday, same time we will be meeting and I will be delivering lectures to you. Thanks a lot for listening to me and inshallah we will meet again. So over to you, Dr. Rashid. I am done with it. And any questions, any queries, you can always send it directly to me. You can always send to Dr. Yes, it has very detailed anatomy number. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It was uh, indeed a very detailed uh, lecture on uh, such a very important topic. Uh, I thank you, and there are few comments uh, who really like uh, your lecture, mashallah. And uh, due to your experience, you, you have really explained the things pretty well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, thank you inshallah, so much, sir. You guys thank you on for your time, inshallah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank inshallah. You inshallah. Next okay. month, uh, next Wednesday, inshallah. Thank Wednesday, you so much. Thank sir. you. Okay, I love it. Love.